series about the future of food. The Great Meat Debate. This week on DW. This is DW News live from Berlin. It's a year since Russia's war in Ukraine turned German foreign policy on its head. In the next few minutes, Chancellor Olaf Scholz is expected to address lawmakers in Parliament and to defend his much criticised approach to supplying arms to Ukraine. He's also expected to counter accusations that the government has fallen short on its pledges to invest in defence. We'll bring you live coverage and analysis. I'm Phil Gale. Welcome to the programme. It's been just over a year since German Chancellor Olaf Scholz made a historic speech to Parliament outlining a major U-turn in foreign policy. The decision to arm Ukraine with defensive weapons signalled a major change to Germany's normally pacifist approach to international conflicts. Chancellor Scholz is due to take stock with another keynote speech in just a few minutes. First, here's a look back at how Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine impacted Berlin's defence and foreign policy making over the last year. 5,000 helmets. That was the help Germany offered Ukraine before Russia invaded. Then Moscow attacked. Within days, Germany reversed its long-standing ban on sending weapons to conflict zones with a historic speech. But with the attack on Ukraine, we have entered a new era. In Kyiv, Kharkiv, Odessa and Mariupol, people are not just defending their homeland, they are fighting for freedom and their democracy, for values that we share with them. As Democrats, as Europeans, we stand by their side, on the right side of history. Scholz's government provided billions in financial and humanitarian aid, voted in favor of sanctions against Moscow, and took in more than half a million Ukrainian refugees over the course of the year. And it started approving deliveries of defensive weapons anti-tank rockets, air defense systems and armored vehicles, for example. For many Ukrainians, however, that was not enough. In the early days of the war, some Ukrainian officials felt Germany's political establishment was too close to Moscow. Over the past decade, Steinmeier established a spider web of contact with Russia. Many people who were involved in that now have a say in the German government. That's a reference to German president Frank-Walter Steinmeier. He had offered to visit Ukraine in April last year, but Kyiv declined. Relations between Berlin and Kyiv were in the deep freeze. Then, long after other Western leaders, Chancellor Scholz made it to Kyiv, and German weapon deliveries started to pick up and make a difference on the battleground. Meanwhile, Germany had to wean itself off Russian coal, oil and gas and make sure there would still be enough energy for the winter ahead. Soaring energy bills put the public's will to support Ukraine to the test. Others feared their country could be dragged into the war itself. Germany has recently pledged to send the main battle tanks Kyiv has long been asking for. One year on from Russia's invasion, Berlin is now one of Ukraine's biggest backers. 
Okay, let's take you uh, live to the German Bundestag now, where German Chancellor Olaf Scholz is addressing Parliament. Honourable Speaker, colleagues. One year ago today, on the seventh day of the war of aggression against Ukraine, then Evgenia Belarusit, a Ukrainian author, wrote in her diary, I can hear an explosion outside. At such times, I'm overcome with fear, and I'm wondering how I and the people I love can be saved in this situation. And now, she writes, we need to be brave. We need to find effective means to fight the aggressor. In my imagination, I think of a hundred different ways that this could all end, how the war could be brought to an end right now. I chose this quotation because I think it's important that we hear Ukrainian voices when we talk about the Russian war in Ukraine. Yevgenia Belaruset expresses two main ideas. First of all, that Ukraine wants this war to end. They wanted it to end from the very first day. Every Ukrainian longs for freedom more than ever, longs for peace more than ever. And to do that, we need to act bravely. Creating peace also means fighting aggression and wrong. So, wie es mehr als 40 Millionen Ukrainerinnen und Ukrainer seit mehr als einem Jahr tun. 40 million Ukrainians have been doing this for more than a year now. They want to live in freedom and peace, as we do. And we will be supporting them as, for as long as is necessary. I know that in this House there is a broad-ranging consensus beyond party divisions. And I'm very grateful to the colleagues from the CSU and the CDU for that. Also, a majority of citizens wants our country to support Ukraine, as we have been doing since the very beginning, with determination, carefully considering our moves and talking to our allies and partners. And we're going to continue with that approach. At the same time, I would like to turn to those in our country who are frightened about the war escalating. Over the last few days, we've seen many demonstrations. Some have expressed their solidarity with Ukraine and asked for more support for Ukraine. Others have demonstrated and asked for immediate peace negotiations with Russia. Against the backdrop of such differing opinions, how can we have a just peace in Ukraine? How can we move closer to that goal? But it's up to the Ukrainians. They were the ones who were attacked. It's Ukrainian citizens who are fighting for the existence of their country. That means that no peace agreement can go above the heads of the Ukrainians. Peace can't be created by calling for never having war again here in Berlin and then not delivering weapons to Ukraine. We know exactly what kind of Ukraine we have under Russian rule with Bucha, Kramatorsk, Ischium and Mariupol. There, Putin's troops have created incredible suffering for the people there and committed war crimes. Peace doesn't mean being subjected to the power of a larger neighbor. If Ukraine weren't allowed to defend itself, it wouldn't be peace. It would be the end of Ukraine. A 
ein Diktatfrieden gegen den Willen der Opfer für A dictated peace against the will of the victims is something that we can't accept for moral reasons, but also if we want to ensure the security of our own country and Europe. What a terrible signal we would be sending out if we were to reward someone who breaks the international security order. We instead need to make sure that our peaceful order is respected. We have seen the consequences of two terrible world wars, and we need to make sure that those rules are ensured. That is what we have in the UN Charter, also in our European security structure. We can see that Putin's goal is to integrate parts of Ukraine into Russia and destroy Ukraine. One of the greatest achievements of Willy Brandt and Helmut Schmidt was the recognition in the Helsinki Treaty that borders couldn't be moved by violence within Europe. Yes, and after the fall of the Berlin Wall, Russia also committed to democracy, pluralism, the rule of law, and free elections in the Paris Treaty. All of those principles have now been broken with brutal repression against Putin's own people. Our thoughts about this should be even clearer. We need to defend our European peace. And war can never be used again as a political, political tool. We must not allow Putin's imperialism to, to win. We have achieved all of these civilizational feats, which were then enshrined in the U UN Treaty and in the Helsinki Treaty. But is Putin ready to return to those principles and to a just peace? At the moment, there are no signs of that happening. Instead, Putin is threatening us with various gestures, first of all by saying that he would not apply the Reset Treaty anymore. Also, the Helsinki Treaty that has been in place since the 1970s is not being respected. But there is no way that we can go forward like this when our peaceful order is being threatened. The only way to stop, to stop Putin is to stop his subordination and repression. It's all the more remarkable that President Zelensky made proposals at the G20 summit in November for a just peace. The federal government will obviously help to bring this just peace about. That's why we are talking to Kyiv and other partners to see how we could bring that about. We also want Ukraine to be able to properly defend itself. With our partners in Asia, Africa and Latin America, we have been promoting the goal of a just peace. And we have been doing that successfully as the results of the UN General Assembly last week showed. And I'm very grateful to Foreign Minister Baerbock for all her efforts in the run-up to that meeting. This result is a clear message to Putin from the world, from the whole community. Stop this war. 
And it's important that that message is heard around the world. When I talk to the Brazilian president and the Indian prime minister, I emphasize these messages. From the very beginning, that has been our message to China at all. When I visited Beijing and then at the G20 summit, then Prime Minister Peng spoke out strongly against any Russian use of nuclear weapons. This is something that brought about de-escalation. It's very positive that China has sent out this clear sig signal and in its 12-point plan has said that there can be no use of chemical or biological weapons. However, China should be discussing this 12-point plan with those most involved, such as President Zelensky. At the G20 meeting, there was no will, unfortunately, to emphasize that message. My message, though, to Beijing is clear. Use your influence in Moscow to persuade them to retreat and do not deliver any weapons to Moscow. Russland sets nach wie vor auf einen militärischen Sieg. Russia is planning, as before, to try and have a military victory, but that isn't going to happen because we are going to support Ukraine together with our partners. Putin is wrong when he thinks that time is on his side. He will not be able to achieve his imperialistic goals. And the more that he sees that and that we will not we will not just look on, the more likely he is to understand what's happening. Then Ukraine will be able to defend itself and its territorial integrity. We are providing humanitarian, military and economic support for Ukrainian citizens. We have provided more than 14 billion euros in the last 12 months, which is an appropriate sum of money for a country of our size. We have worked together with our partners and allies to defend Ukraine and help them resist with artillery and air defense systems, which have been used in a highly effective way for months now. We are also expanding our support. For years, we have been using the Patriot systems, delivering MARDA and Leopard 2 combat tanks. All of our allies and partners who can do this should be doing that as well. Foreign Minister Baerbock and Defence Minister Pistorius have been working very well in that direction. I'd like to thank them for their successful efforts. We are working together with Poland, Sweden, Spain and Portugal to deliver the Leopard 2 tanks. We're working also together with the Netherlands and Italy to deliver to deliver defense systems. Multiple rocket launchers. On that, we're working with the United Kingdom and the United States. We also want to carry out common procurement for artillery ammunition, for anti tank ammunition as well. In the next few weeks, we are putting forward more plans, which will allow Ukraine to defend itself from aerial attacks. At the same time, we want to make sure there's a reliable supply of replacement parts and ammunition. Since the very beginning, the German armed forces have trained thousands of soldiers in Ukraine, and more training has been planned in the near future. We've done this in close cooperation with the United States and the United Kingdom. Our country is one of the central places in Europe for the training of Ukrainian soldiers. I have seen the pictures of this myself. Here, the German armed forces are doing a fantastic job. Thank you. 
all of our soldiers, men and women, all of the civilians who do this, deserve our greatest thanks. Thank you very much. I know that the way in which we're providing this support, the way we're delivering weapons to Ukraine, is something unusual in our country. I understand that citizens aren't saying hooray about that. But we never take these decisions lightly to supply weapons in our government. Yes, we are supporting Ukraine to defend the European peaceful order. And in each of our decisions, we are very careful to make sure that NATO does not become a warring party. That is something I've agreed on with the American president. I'm going to be traveling to Washington today to continue these discussions with President Biden in order to cooperate more closely. And we are doing that more than ever and with more trust than ever. The European Union and NATO are united as never before, 12 months after war broke out. We recently agreed on our 10th sanctions package in the European Union against Russia. We have laid the foundations also for the reconstruction of Ukraine. We have created clarity about the fact that the future of the Western Balkan countries, Moldova, Georgia and Ukraine, lies in the European Union. We have seen how reforms have been driven onwards, especially the long-running conflict between Serbia and Kosovo. There we've seen improvements as well. President Bucic and Prime Minister Kuti expressed their clear approval of this basic treaty that has been suggested by the French and we will be continuing to work in that direction. Also, we want to make sure that the armaments industry in Europe is working together. We have the future aerial fighter jet system, FCAT, and the Sky Initiative. That is part of our defense within NATO. With Sweden and Denmark, Two close friends, we are working on that proposal as well. In a very short period of time, we have managed to free ourselves of our Russian dependency on, on Russian energy. And we have also then increased our efforts in the armaments industry. Repower EU with more investments for clean tech, with easier subsidy rules, digitalization, an alliance for the battery and chips act. We have managed to do all of this in a very short period of time, and these are steps towards the geopolitical progress of Europe. We need to make sure that Europe is competitive and that we have the right commodities available, so that Europe can be a presence in the multipolar world of the 21st century and set the standard. Germany, since this watershed moment, has also become more resilient, especially when we look at what's happening with the armed forces. We don't want to neglect the armed forces anymore. That's why we have our special fund for the armed forces, and I'm very grateful for the support from the largest opposition party. Overall, we are going to be increasing our budget for defence so that we achieve the 2% goal for NATO. The promise that I made on the 27th of February last year still applies. 
We have started important procurement for the F-35 fighter jets. Other projects which are planned in the special fund are going to start in the course of this year. There is also long-term investment, which is going to be covered by the special fund. For instance, tank howitzers and other types of armaments will then be procured in the coming months. All of that is going to be carried out. We want to make sure that we can live up to the fair expectations of our partners and allies and do so in a way that's appropriate for a country of our size. A year ago, on the 27th of February, I said in this House that no ifs, no buts, we are going to live up to our commitments in NATO. And we have followed through with actions, with our brigade in Lithuania, by supporting Poland and Slovakia with aerial, aerial defense, with our cooperation with Norway and in the Baltic and North Seas. This year, 17,000 of our troops will be part of the quick reaction force. We are also going to continually provide our support. We will be ready for deployment in very quickly. Here we've seen a major change in the armaments industry. We want to make sure that we have quick and easily planned procurement for the army. We need all kinds of equipment and ammunition. This means we need long-term contracts and payments in advance to be able to build up our capacity. In Germany, therefore, we are building an industrial foundation that will support peace in Europe. That is also one of the recognizable achievements since the watershed Zeitenwende. When we think anew about these security problems since the Zeitenwende, it's not just a matter of military, of building up the military. There's misinformation, there are cyber attacks. We are also arming ourselves against those, since open and free societies like ours need to be strong and resilient. We have shown how strong and resilient we can be when we put Russia under pressure by stopping our energy supply from there. We have managed to get through the winter and do so in style without Russian energy supplies. We heard about whole branches of industry being shut down by people having cold homes and a winter of discontent after a hot autumn. But none of this happened because we acted with determination. And when I say we did this, then our whole country is behind us. Together, the lender and the federal authorities have put together energy packages. The prices have come down, and now consumers are noticing that. Our gas storage facilities are 70% full, which gives us a good buffer to get through next the next winter as well. It's been usually helpful that citizens have saved a lot of energy and continue to do so. Many have already installed heat pumps or are planning to do so. We have invested in environmentally friendly production. In record time, we have got LNG terminals up and running. The excellent engineers in our country 
all of our specialists, our crafts and tradesmen have all made that possible. And we would like to thank you all for your efforts. So that's uh, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz addressing the uh, German parliament a, a year after Germany's so-called Zeitenwende, this uh, dramatic shift uh, in defence and uh, foreign policy uh, that was prompted by the war in Ukraine. Our chief political correspondent, Nina Haase, is uh, at the Bundestag and has been uh, listening in. Uh, uh, welcome, uh, Nina. Uh, what's your first impression of what we heard from the, the Chancellor there? Well, I think this is a speech that will be good for history books because essentially you heard the German Chancellor defend his strategy when it came to Germany's reaction after Russia's full-scale invasion. We all remember that three days after Russia launched that large-scale invasion last year, uh, Olaf Scholz stood here in Parliament and delivered a very big speech announcing a lot of promises, essentially also readjusting decades of German foreign policy and energy policy, security policy, and announcing a special budget for the German army of 100 billion euros. So this is something where now Olaf Scholz is taking stock and he summarized um, his uh, measures, his methods, but also tried to justify why Germany is still supporting Ukraine. He said and started this speech by saying Ukraine wants to fight this and we will support Ukraine for as long as is necessary. Ukraine does not want a dictated peace. Ukraine wants Russia to leave and we will support them so that Putin does not win. Right. Uh, and there was uh, applause when he, he, he talked about the, those changes to uh, German procurement, which have been so, uh, so criticised uh, uh, over the last year. Uh, people have said that Germany makes a decision and then takes ages to follow through. He promised to, to speed that up. Well, yes, but he also promised to uh, spend those 100 billion euros fairly swiftly. He's also announced that Germany is going to stick to NATO's 2% defence goal, and that is also not happening this year. So he is making a lot of promises, and people are working behind the scenes. But to be frank, you have to just accept the fact that Germany was not prepared for a situation like this. Germany is having to overhaul lots of decades-old principles. There are lots of very static structures still in place in lots of those ministries that are now so vital. Germany thought that uh, there was going to be peace in Europe uh, for the next couple of decades, and they were wrong. So now they're having to uh, build up structures, um, and that is just taking time. But we heard, for example, that in the defence ministry, there's now a new command that is in charge of coordinating all those efforts for homeland security, if you will, and they are being restaffed. But these things just do take time. But of course, it is something where the uh, opposition can justifiably say uh, you are being very slow and the Chancellor is having to defend and he is going to have to deliver very soon. Uh, now, he made some... Uh, he talked about the, the supporting Ukraine for as long as necessary and uh, was thankful for the cross-party support on this issue and saying that the majority of, of, of citizens uh, want uh, Germany to continue to support Ukraine. Has that changed over the year, especially as, as Germany has become more assertive in this field? It is a very interesting development. If you look at German society and where they stand on this topic, there is massive support from the Conservatives, uh, so Angela Merkel's party, essentially, who are no longer in power. But they are supporting the Chancellor's cause in the, uh, this issue when it comes to uh, supply uh, with weapons for Ukraine. And for them, things could be um, happening even faster. So they are pushing the Chancellor. At the same time, you also have the fringes. So you have the far left and the far right who are saying, no, we want peace negotiations now with Russia. They haven't changed uh, their image of Russia. They say it is something where we just need to stop this war now. We need to get back to normal. And the Chancellor is having to defend his course and also the Conservatives' course, if you will, um, by saying this is for the Ukrainians to decide. And if they say that Putin is not willing to negotiate under conditions that are acceptable for us, then this is something where we will have to stand by Ukraine because this is not just 
process about Ukraine, the Chancellor always gives this argument that we are also defending Europe's peace at large. And he uh, said in his speech today that uh, Europe's borders cannot be shifted by violence. This is not something that is tolerable. And this is something where we have to support Ukraine so that the aggressor does not win and get away with this. Thank you for that, uh, Nina. Nina Haase at the Bundestag, Germany's parliament. Now to the G20 meeting in India. And uh, India's Prime Minister, Narendra Modi, has called for unity as he welcomed G20 foreign ministers to Delhi. Russia's year-long invasion of Ukraine and its economic impacts are set to dominate the agenda. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken has said he expects most of the G20 to continue to back Ukraine and that he has no plans for bilateral meetings with his Russian or Chinese counterparts. In a video address uh, opening the summit, he said the group needs, to, uh, needs a reset to solve current global issues. We must all acknowledge that multilateralism is in crisis today. The experience of the last few years, financial crisis, climate change, pandemic, terrorism and wars clearly shows that global governance has failed. Well, our Delhi bureau chief, Amrita Achima, talked me through what the Indian Prime Minister meant in his statement. Uh, Phil, what he exactly said that the architecture of global governance, which was set up after the Second World War, had failed in two respects. One was it was aiming at preventing conflict by balancing competing interests, and the second was international cooperation. And in both these cases, he said it had failed. And obviously, this was to some extent a reflection of the situation at the moment, the geopolitical tensions. And secondly, he also said this failure had affected the developing countries the most. And that was the second key point that he wants to make uh, during this uh, meeting. He feels that India, as when it holds the G10 presidency, uh, sorry, a G20 presidency, is the voice of the global south. What else can we expect from today's meeting? Well, I think there's a, they're focusing a lot of uh, uh, sessions on issues which are close to the developing world. For example, they're talking about reform of multi multilateralism. In fact, one of the things Modi said, multilateralism is in a state of crisis. Then they're looking at the impact on the developing world. They're going to focus on food security, energy security, as well as fertilizer security. They want to look at um, terrorism, how to combat terrorism, narcotics, as well as huma humanitarian disasters. So all in all, a wide range of things. But the thing which is overshadowing this whole summit is what will be the final communique over Russia and Ukraine? Okay, thank you so much for that, uh, Amrita. Amrita Chima in New Delhi. Well, while the war in Ukraine takes centre stage in Delhi, Moscow has been increasing tensions with claims that uh, Kyiv is using drones to attack its infrastructure, which Ukraine has rejected. Uh, President uh, Putin has even accused the West of using terrorist cells to attack its territory. Drones over Russia. The Kremlin claims Ukraine has tried to use them to attack civilian infrastructure. A drone fell in a residential area here in Belgorod. 30 kilometers from the Ukrainian border. But Russia says a Ukrainian drone also crashed hundreds of kilometers from the border in the Moscow region. Russian state media also report a drone being spotted over this oil storage facility in Krasnodar before it went up in flames. Russian President Vladimir Putin has called on his intelligence service to stamp out threats to Russian soil from Ukraine and the West. It has to do with the West's attempts to revive extremist and terrorist cells on our territory. We know they never shied away from using radicals and extremists in their own interests. They'll use any means available to fight us. Meanwhile, the war of attrition in eastern Ukraine drags on. The heavy fighting along the front here and in southern Ukraine has seen attempts by both sides to move the line, sometimes by just a few meters. Military experts say Ukraine could start a counteroffensive in the south in about a month's time.
dann könnten sie die russische Front in zwei Teile... Then they could split the Russian Front in two and bring their artillery much closer to Crimea. Then they'd be in the position to cut off or knock out the logistic routes to Crimea with HIMARS rockets at a range of 80 kilometers. Then they could bring the war to Crimea without having to march in with conventional troops. Support has come from NATO's chief, who once again pledged military aid to Ukraine. So both NATO allies have agreed that Ukraine will become a member of our alliance, but at the same time that, that is a long-term perspective. What is, the, what is the issue now is to ensure that Ukraine prevail as a sovereign independent nation and that therefore we need to support Ukraine. In Bakhmut, Ukrainian troops need all the support they can get. Their position in the strategically important eastern city is almost completely surrounded by Russian mercenaries. Only one road out remains open if the time comes to retreat. Well, the station master who was on duty when two trains crashed head on in Greece, uh, claiming dozens of lives, is due to appear before a prosecutor later today. The 59 year old will have to explain how a passenger train with around 350 people on board was allowed to run on the same line as a freight train for several kilometers before they collided. Rescue teams are still searching through the wreckage at the site as work continues to identify the remains of the dead. Greece's Prime Minister has, uh, has said tragic human error was mainly to blame for the disaster, which has now sparked protests across the country. Anger on the streets of Athens after dozens were killed in Greece's deadliest train crash. Students in Thessaloniki also demonstrated on Wednesday evening as they called for accountability. This CCTV footage shows a moment late on Tuesday evening when two trains collided in central Greece with carriages bursting into flames. Emergency teams and rescue crews worked through the night and in thick smoke, searching for survivors, scouring each broken carriage by torchlight for signs of life, and the bodies of those killed in the crash. Those who escaped with their lives described the moment of impact. We heard a big bang. It was 10 nightmarish seconds. We were thrown around in the wagon, eventually falling on our sides. The commotion stopped, then there was panic. Cables everywhere. The fire was everywhere. As we were rolling, we were burning. Fire was everywhere. As we landed, a fire erupted right next to us. This man here saw a hole, so we managed to get out through there. After visiting the scene, the Greek Prime Minister said those responsible would be held accountable. Justice will do its own work. Responsibilities will be assigned. Meanwhile, the state will stand by the families of the victims. We will mourn our children, our siblings, our friends. We will remain united in this tragedy as well. Officials said some of those killed can only be identified through genetic testing. So for the friends and relatives of those missing, an agonizing wait for news goes on. This is DW News, live from Berlin. Here's a reminder of our top stories at this hour. The German Chancellor has defended his government's record of delivering weapons to Ukraine and urged China not to send weapons to Russia. Olaf Scholz's comments were delivered in a speech to Parliament a year after his government announced a major U-turn in foreign policy in response to Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. And ahead of a meeting of G20 foreign ministers, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi has urged world leaders to find common ground. The meeting is expected to be dominated by Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine and, the, and its economic impact. India's remained neutral on the war, but the US is hoping for a clearer condemnation of Russia. 
That's it. You're up to date. I'll have more world news at the top of the hour. Around the clock, of course, it's available on DW.com or on the DW app. Have a good day. This week on World Stories. Ukrainian refugees resettle in Germany. A new cow census in Corsica. We begin in Ukraine, where locals are threatening to boycott the 2024 Olympics if Russian athletes participate. It's an unthinkable idea for many since dozens of Ukrainian athletes have been killed in the war. For someone who lived such a short life, Vladimir and Grushuk left so much behind. A well-looked-after pet cat, a career as a national decathlon champion, and an older sister who will always remember him like this. He was sociable, friendly, and the best. He had a strong character. He was stubborn. If it weren't for these character traits, he wouldn't be in sports. If it weren't for these character traits, he wouldn't have gone to war. In late January, Russia's war in Ukraine brought an abrupt end to the 22-year-old's life and his ambition to one day compete in the Olympics. According to Ukraine's foreign minister, Vladimir is one of more than 200 athletes and coaches who've been killed in the fighting. In light of these deaths and the devastation the war has caused, Ukrainian officials, including here at the Ministry of Sports, have called on the International Olympic Committee to ban Russian and Belarusian athletes from competing in the Paris 2024 Olympics. The International Olympic Committee says it's considering allowing those athletes to compete, but only under neutral flags that don't represent their countries. He showed us this video of a Ukrainian shot put thrower training under shelling as well as these images that show the scale of destruction of Ukrainian sports facilities. There's also concern that Russian athletes could use the Olympics to taunt Ukrainians. Serhii Penisenko, a former coach of the national bike motocross team, says after facing Russians on the battlefield, it's hard for him to imagine how they could ever meet again as sportsmen. How can we stand next to our murders on a pedestal? How? A Russian foreign ministry spokeswoman said attempts to squeeze Moscow out of international sport were doomed to fail. The International Olympic Committee insists its mission is to bring the world together in peaceful competition. That mission will now not include Vladimir Andrushuk. More than a million people have fled to Germany from Ukraine since the war began, putting German housing in short supply. But the town of Gosla is still offering many newcomers a place to stay. A taste of home. Today, Yulia Ostapenko is making Ukrainian borscht, beetroot soup. She fled from Kiev to Germany in March 2022 with her two daughters. Since then, they've been living in the small city of Gosla. Her husband, a policeman, stayed behind. Yulia's daughters, Anya and Maria, go to local school and kindergarten. At first, the family lived in a hostel room provided by the district, but moved to a private apartment just two months later. At the beginning, it wasn't very important where we lived, because the situation was so terrible. We didn't have any expectations. All we wanted was safety. That we ended up moving here with these great conditions is very cool. Just over 2,000 Ukrainian refugees like Yulia and her kids have come to the district of Gosla since the war began. The local population is about 130,000 people. There are many older people here and many apartments have been left empty. The local administration created a system to match refugees up with the owners of that free accommodation. The district also has several temporary arrival centers for refugees on offer, including a hotel and a hostel. 
If I imagine that I had to live for several months in a sports hall with lots of people I don't know, of course that kind of thing can create conflict. And of course, having people living in apartments across the Goslau district allows us to integrate them better. And then we also have a lot of volunteers in villages and cities who help these people. Like in this former casino in the city of Gosla, now a center for donations. Around 30 volunteers have been here almost every day to help the refugees with advice and to sort through clothes, furniture and household objects, all things the Ukrainians desperately need when they move into completely empty apartments. They come here and the first thing they say is, do you have cutlery, blankets, do you have a pillow? It's almost unimaginable what that means, to really have nothing. The state has now officially stopped assigning Ukrainians to the Goslar district, but the local administration is expecting around 700 asylum seekers from other countries to arrive in the coming months. Some of them may not be as lucky as Yulia and her family. The local administration says the stock of empty apartments may run out soon. Thousands of people from Burkina Faso are fleeing jihadist terrorist groups to neighboring Ghana. There, aid workers are trying to support the refugees as best they can, but many feel abandoned by the Ghanaian authorities. Amabile Ilasha Afugu and his family may not have much to go around themselves, but that's not limiting their generosity. Like many residents here, Afugu is feeding dozens of Bukinabe refugees who fled across the border. This kind of Buku Haram and jihadists, we heard them years back. That was somewhere in Nigeria. We never knew to come close to us here, but it has come. So it's years today. Tomorrow may be ours. And where will we run to? With Naba, it's just a short walk from Burkina Faso. Thousands of displaced Bukinabis crossed to Ghanaian settlements following a recent attack. Many people here are from the same ethnic group as the new arrivals, but they say they need more help from the government to continue hosting, feeding, and providing shelter for them. What we were also trying to prevent was trying to create a condition in which, uh, you know, it will be more people will be attracted 